Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. So I'm going to give an overview of breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, um, kind of a general overview, and then at the end, kind of focus on uh, radiotherapy. And I really want to thank our residents who helped me um, with some of the slides. As you guys learned, um, probably our residency program is a four-year residency program after internship. And so um, Margie Kozak and Michael Dorkin helped with some of the slides from previous presentations they've given. So Margie's one of our senior residents and Michael's one of our um, uh, first year uh, residents. And then Katie and Melissa who are on um, the call today are going to help with the discussion. And please interrupt me, Katie and Melissa, if there's some chat questions that we want to address or we can address them at the end. Okay. So basically, um, breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed cancer and the second leading cause of cancer-related death in women. There's over 260,000 cases per year in the U.S., and the lifetime risk of an individual is now one in eight. Um, interestingly, the median age of diagnosis is about 61 years, but here at Stanford, we actually see a lot of younger women, so even women in their 30s and, and 40s, and unfortunately, we've even had a couple women in their 20s. Um, but generally, it's um, a diagnosis of women after they've gone through menopause. About two-thirds of patients have no significant risk factors, and um, so sometimes people come in and say, you know, I did everything right. I ate well, I exercised, you know, what caused the cancer, and I think we still don't have a good understanding for those w women. There is um, a small percentage, about half to 1% of all breast cancer cases that occur in men, and I, in my practice, probably see about one male breast cancer a year, so it's not very common, but it is something that um, you want to be aware of. So um, looking at the anatomy of the breast, as you probably have learned already in your anatomy classes, is that the breast, um, generally the uh, milk production is in the lobes of the breast, um, and then you know, the lobes, and then the ducts, um, uh, the milk uh, goes through the ducts to the nipple. So we can have lobular cancers as well as ductal cancers, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The anatomy of the breast is such that the breast itself also extends into the axillary tail. Um, and then we have uh, drainage of the breast into the axillary lymph nodes going up to the infraclavicular nodes as well as the supraclavicular nodes. So those are the areas, and here's another um, picture of what we call, we look at the pectoralis minor muscle as uh, distinguishing between what we call level one of the axilla, level two of the axilla, which is actually behind the pec minor, and level three of the axilla, which is um, superior and medial to the pec minor, and also called um, infraclavicular nodes. And the other potential area of spread, as I just mentioned, is the supraclavicular area. Um, sometimes when we have tumors in the medial or central part of the breast, they can um, metastasize medially to the internal mammary lymph nodes. So that's another area that we look at when evaluating breast cancers. So going back, like I said, to breast cancer risk factors, we um, historically have heard about estrogen exposure, hormone replacement therapy, which was um, hor uh, estrogen and progesterone therapy that often was given to women after they went through menopause, thinking that it was ha helping their cardiovascular risk factors. But it was shown in large randomized trial to be associated with the increased risk of breast cancer um, by about 2% uh, for every year of use. Um, Short-term hormone replacement therapy has not been associated with increased risks. Uh, so sometimes um, women who will have it for short term uh, doesn't increase their risk, but definitely uh, is encouraged not to continue it long term. And then there's been some varying reports on the use of oral contraceptives, and it's not been consistently shown to increase the risk of breast cancer, but there had been some series that suggested that. Um, family history definitely is known to have an increased risk of breast cancer and about a quarter of women who will have a positive family history. Um, but interestingly, when tested uh, for genetic mutations, there's actually only about 5 to 10% of women diagnosed with breast cancer who have a hereditary mutation. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the most widely um, known uh, mutations. Those were identified in 1994 and 1995 and were tested um, early on, and they have a very high risk of breast cancer on the order of 60 to 80 percent lifetime risk. And so in these women, um, they will potentially undergo uh, 
risk reducing surgery, so mastectomies um, early on. There are other genes that we are now identifying in these large panels that are being um, used in, uh, and we still don't know exactly what uh, risk this confers, but definitely has been shown to have increased risk uh, with P53, P10, STK11, ATM, CHECK2, Fanconi anemia, and PALB2. Um, some women who have had a personal history of an abnormality, so either some atypia that's been diagnosed or what we call lobular carcinoma in situ, it is shown to have an increased risk of breast cancer. And interestingly, women with dense breast tissue, I always had a hard time understanding this because at first the thought is, oh, you just can't use mammography as well. But indeed, the women with denser breast tissue do uh, have a higher risk of breast cancer, and it's thought that it's just something to do with the glandular tissue. And then, of course, lifestyle factors have been um, explored, looking at um, diet, alcohol, obesity, um, and we know now that women who've been previously exposed to radiation, for example, uh, young children or young women who've been diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease who receive um, uh, mediastinal radiation definitely have a higher chance of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. But that uh, risk doesn't actually appear until about 20 years later after their treatment. So these are um, women that we will uh, follow very closely over their lifetime. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of genetic mutations that are now being identified with increased risk of breast cancer. And so anytime a woman has a strong family history or it presents at a young age, so in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, we will send them for genetic testing to identify um, whether or not there's a genetic mutation that um, contributed to their uh, risk of developing breast cancer. And this can help guide their surgical management and then their screening over time for other malignancies as well. Generally, uh, 40 to 60% of breast cancers are detected on routine screening mammogram, meaning that they don't have any symptoms at all. Uh, but there are some who d present with symptoms. So usually it's a mass that can be palpated. Sometimes there can be changes in the skin, either retraction of the skin or redness of the skin, or nipple discharge, either clear nipple discharge or bloody nipple discharge. The most common presentation, though, is a painless mass. So women a lot of times worry about pain, but usually pain is not associated with breast cancer. Um, Sometimes about 5% of the time it can be, but often it's often a painless mass that people will notice um, on the self-exam. And um, sometimes people will present with a lymph node, so axillary lymphadenopathy, and they don't necessarily have something identifiable in the breast itself. We talk about screening, and I wanted to make a distinction between a screening mammography versus diagnostic mammography. Screening mammography is in women who have no symptoms or complaints. They do standard views called cranial caudal and medial lateral oblique views, which gives um, multiple dimensions for the radiologist to review. And sometimes they'll give additional views if they want to look at a specific area. Diagnostic mammography, however, is when somebody actually has a symptom, as I just described, either a mass, nipple discharge, skin changes, or sometimes even pain, they'll focus on it. They give additional views uh, looking at that specific area, and the, uh, the radiologist actually looks at it in real time to determine whether or not additional imaging is needed and or whether a biopsy is needed. Uh, I wasn't going to talk about screening mammography in terms of going back to, um, there's been a lot of debate as to what age people should start screening and how frequently it should be done. Currently, Stanford recommends starting at age 40 and does recommend annual mammography, but there has been some debate in the various societies. Um, and looking at the mammography, it's really evolved over time. It used to be just... Uh, plain 2D imaging on film, then it became digital, and now we have what's called tomosynthesis, which is we kind of call it 3D imaging, but it's not exactly 3D, but they do an arc around the breast and reconstruct it so you can kind of scroll through the breast tissue. And you can see in these images that what might not have been very noticeable in the past on 3D or tomosynthesis views uh, stands out quite a bit more. And I've seen our breast imagers um, are able to detect breast cancers more readily on the tomosynthesis views than uh, the standard views. 
We sometimes use ultrasound in a focused um, fashion if we have something palpable or some area of concern. There are automated whole breast ultrasound uh, machines that are sometimes used for screening. We actually have just gotten that here at Stanford. I don't think it's been rolled out yet. <laughs> and I think now it's even further delayed. It'll probably be in the summer or the fall. But that's something that's also being incorporated in screening and diagnos uh, diagnostic imaging. And then um, another kind of more sophisticated test is the breast uh, magnetic resonance imaging, where a patient will undergo contrast injection with gadolinium. These images are obtained in the prone position, but you can see that the tumor just jumps out and you can see it very readily. So we often used uh, breast MRI uh, at the time of diagnosis to help guide uh, management. And sometimes it's used in screening in women who are at high risk, such as mutation carriers, or those who've had um, prior uh, radiation to the chest, um, as an example. Uh, it's controversial, so not every institution will do it, and it's an expensive test. So we have to think about it in a cost uh, awareness fashion, but sometimes it can add to our um, diagnosis, diagnostic uh, interpretations. Um, looking at histology, I talked a little bit about um, the ductal system, but ductal carcinoma in situ, oh, let me just go through, I have pictures down here. Ductal carcinoma in situ is when there's some abnormal changes that are still within the ductal system. So oftentimes this is diagnosed on mammography as calcifications that are an indication of abnormal changes. And what's interesting, it's kind of considered a precancer. So it's actually stage zero, but we still often treat it with surgery and sometimes followed by radiation. There's a little bit of debate, however, as to whether or not we actually need to treat it. And in some there's some ongoing studies looking at observation without treatment for early um, DCIS. But historically, it's been thought that if you didn't do anything, that over time it would develop into invasive ductal car carcinoma, which is when the abnormal cells break out of the ductal system into the parenchyma. And so this is um, a common diagnosis of invasive ductal carcinoma. And then a little bit less commonly, but about 20, 15 to 20% of the cancers are what we call invasive lobular carcinoma. So these are cancers that um, arise from the lobules, and they have a little bit of a different pattern in that they're called single filing. And so they sometimes can be much more infiltrative and a little bit more difficult to see on mammography, and that's when MRI um, is actually very useful. So we also, in breast cancer, look at different molecular subtypes. So um, we have uh, staining for different proteins, uh, specifically the estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor that tells us whether we have an ER positive or an ER negative tumor, and this really guides treatment. The other thing that has emerged over the last decade is looking and identifying human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 uh, cancers. So this is a protein that we now, it used to uh, portend a bad prognosis because these HER2 cancers can be very aggressive, but we ha now have different therapies that can target this protein. And now these HER2 cancers are, uh, do much better than historically. And uh, you may have learned about this in your preclinical uh, um, studies, but we looked at, um, there's been many studies looking at gene expression profiling done er in the early 2000s and actually started here at Stanford. Um, uh, where they identified five intrinsic subtypes of breast cancer, termed luminal A, luminal B, normal breast-like, HER2-enriched, and basal-like, which typically tend to be what we call triple negative cancers. There's been additional subtypes added. And now, while we don't run gene expression profiling on every cancer that we identify, we use the ER, PR, and HER2 staining to identify what we call a luminal A-like cancer or luminal B-like cancer, and that helps guide treatment. So, Dave, so just wanted to um, interject. There was a good question posed about DCIS and LCIS and whether they have oh. uh, similar cancer risk. So I was just, I mean, you can answer more fully, but I was just kind of- Thank you. I did treat them differently. And 
Yes, thank you. Yes. I didn't bring up LCIS because we don't treat it, but I probably should have just for the overview. So LCIS, which is lobular carcinoma in site two, uh, is considered a um, kind of a risk factor, but it's not um, considered a cancer. So for example, DCIS, we actually treat because we think it develops into an invasive cancer, whereas LCIS, we often don't treat, but we use it as a risk modifier, meaning somebody who has LCIS is probably at higher risk of developing breast cancer. And it can be either invasive lobular or invasive ductal. So it's not necessarily that someone with LCIS de develops invasive lobular carcinoma, um, but it is looked at um, uh, histologically, like I said, to um, kind of screen people and put them in risk categories. But right now, we don't currently treat it. I don't know if I answered that question. <laughs> um, is that kind of just the general question was what, um, I can't see the chat so for some reason. Yeah, it's just whether they have similar cancer risks. So I, you know, they can pipe in if, um, if they feel otherwise. I think that, that that answers it. I mean, we do treat DCAS, but we do not uh, at, at this point, proceed with treating LCIS if it's LCIS alone. Right. right. So the first uh, treatment modality that is commonly used is surgery. Now I say that commonly because now sometimes we give uh, chemotherapy first, but generally the paradigm is to start with surgery. And historically, the main treatment was mastectomy. Now years and years ago, it was a radical mastectomy. And that included not only removing the breast, but also removing the pectoralis muscles. So both the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor muscles as well as levels one, two, and three of the lymph nodes. So what ended up happening is, this is not a good picture of it, but it was really, people were like skeletonized. So you could literally see their ribs and taking out all those uh, lymph nodes really put them at risk of lymphedema or arm swelling. Um, that soon got replaced by what was called the modified radical mastectomy, which was removing of the breast, but preserving the pectoralis muscles. So you could still have you know, the muscles overlying the ribs, and then limiting the lymph node surgery to levels one and two, which decreased the chance of lymphedema. Now, probably in the, I guess it's the 80s or so, 70s and 80s, there were large randomized trials in the U.S. and across the world that compared um, mastectomy to lumpectomy, which is removing just the tumor plus a rim of normal tissue. Um, these studies showed no difference in overall survival, so women lived the same number of years whether they had the mastectomy or lumpectomy, but there was a higher chance of recurrence when you had residual breast tissue. So then studies started exploring radiotherapy, termed whole breast radiotherapy after lumpectomy. And indeed, the whole breast radiotherapy reduced the chance of recurrence from about 30 to 40% down to about 10 to 15% or such. So after those studies were presented um, and published, like I said, in the uh, 80s, um, lumpectomy followed by whole breast radiotherapy became a standard option for women with early stage breast cancer. Women certainly could still go on to mastectomy, so either of those were acceptable options. And moving forward, um, surgery has really evolved, and now we use the term skin sparing mastectomy, which means you remove um, the, the breast, but you leave a, a larger envelope of normal skin, as well as nipple sparing mastectomy, which means you leave the nipple areolar complex. What this allows is for a little bit better reconstruction in the sense that either with an implant, usually with an implant, but sometimes with um, a tissue, abdominal tissue flap, you get a little bit more of a normal appearing um, reconstructive breast. Um, so this is now an option for women who undergo mastectomies. We often, um, just to kind of go through re reconstruction real quickly, is that sometimes people will be offered an implant-based reconstruction, or there have been a lot of microvascular surgical techniques that have evolved that allow for transfer of tissue from the abdomen to the breast to reconstruct um, the chest wall. So women may consider that as well. The other um, thing that we talk about with uh, breast cancer is 
treatment or assessment rather of the lymph nodes. As I mentioned, the lymph nodes in the axilla are often the first echelon of drainage. And so historically, um, both with mastectomy as well as with lumpectomy, an axillary lymph node dissection was offered to women with invasive cancer. This would uh, remove, as I mentioned years ago, it was the full axilla and then it became levels one and levels two. However, that increased the risk of lymphedema. So um, over the last couple of uh, decade or so, the sentinel lymph node biopsy was introduced for breast cancer. It originally was um, uh, used for melanoma actually, and then it evolved into breast cancer and then other diseases are also use using it. Um, this is actually not a great picture, I apologize, but the technique that we use um, is use either using a radioactive uh, tracer or a blue dye that, and they inject four injections around the areola. Used to be they'd inject to the tumor, but now they actually do it around the areola. And then um, they would trace it to that first lymph node called the sentinel lymph node. So it would either be radioactive or it would take up the blue dye, and the surgeon then would dissect out that um, uh, node. Now, if it is negative, then the surgeon will stop and not take any additional lymph nodes. And the advantage, of course, is you just confirm that the breast cancer has not spread to the lymph nodes, um, but you also then minimize the risk of lymphedema. It used to also be that if it was positive, then the uh, surgeon would go in and take out additional lymph nodes. Although now with early stage breast cancer, sometimes the surgeon won't do that um, because we come in with radiotherapy. But it, so it's definitely evolved over time in terms of assessment and surgical management of the lymph nodes. Um, what about systemic therapy? That's uh, Obviously, that's not my area of expertise, but I can kind of talk about it in the sense that um, any historically, anyone with a large tumor or with lymph node involvement would get chemotherapy. But now we're kind of teasing out which patients might benefit from chemotherapy and which ones might not. And we now have um, uh, genomic assays that can help us distinguish higher risk patients who may benefit from chemotherapy versus lower risk patients. Um, we look at the estrogen receptor, as I mentioned, and those that are ER positive will get a recommendation for either tamoxifen, um, which is often used in premenopausal women, or an aromatase inhibitor, which is used in postmenopausal uh, women, which basically blocks uh, the production of estrogen. And these um, agents have been shown to improve overall survival in women with invasive cancer that's ER positive. We're now looking at an era, interestingly, of CDK4-6 inhibitors, which have been studied in the metastatic setting and now being studied in the adjuvant or early stage breast cancer, which are shown to improve upon just not just blocking estrogen, because it's thought that some tumors um, can be resistant to these agents. So it actually makes the um, anti-estrogen therapy even more effective. And I mentioned the HER2 positive tumors, which historically did not do well, but now we have monoclonal antibodies against the HER2 protein, as well as tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And there's just, in fact, it exploded over the last year to how many HER2 targeted agents there are now. Um, being studied and approved by the FDA for these tumors. So there's a lot of different options now, and these tumors generally do much better um, than they did historically. Immunotherapy is also exploding. It's been um, shown and studied in melanoma and lung cancers, and now it's being explored in breast cancer. So I think in the future, in the next few years for sure, we'll see a lot more of that in the, uh, breast cancers. And now radiation therapy, which is what we do. Um, uh, so radiation therapy for breast cancer, it's used in what we call breast conservation therapy. So that's after lumpectomy, as I mentioned, where we follow that with whole breast radiotherapy, both for ductal carcinoma in situ or invasive cancers. It's also used after mastectomy when we have large tumors where we know even after removal of the breast, there can be recurrence along the skin or the scar where the breast was. Um, or in a situation where there's a lot of lymph nodes in involved where we also know that 
chance of what we call a local regional recurrence is very high, we add radiotherapy to the chest wall and the uh, lymph node regions. And then uh, regional nodal irradiation, as I mentioned, both to the axilla, the superclav, and then sometimes the internal mammary nodes. Um, when we're talking about the breast itself, so the intact breast after lumpectomy, we um, historically have used the term whole breast radiotherapy because we treat the entire breast tissue uh, that's remaining. But we also have different techniques now where we might consider what we call partial breast radiation. And that is where we focus the radiation just to the surgical cavity. Now, um, the terminology has evolved to suggest, like I mentioned, that the dose, because it's giving only to the surgical cavity, it's called partial breast. And we call it accelerated because the smaller volume of tissue allows us to deliver the dose over the course of one to five days, rather than what typically for whole breast has been six to seven weeks. Um, although now with whole breast, we sometimes do it even shorter over three to four weeks. And by that, I mean it's daily treatment, so once a day over several weeks. So you can imagine um, by cutting that treatment time down, it makes it much more convenient for patients. Um, there are a lot of different techniques. Historically, uh, I'll show you some pictures. Um, it was called what's called interstitial brachytherapy, which is using needle catheters. And that evolved to more recently people using intracavitary brachytherapy and then just using external beam radiotherapy. And then some institutions, including our own, using intraoperative radiotherapy. So interstitial brachytherapy actually was used many, many years ago, whereby you could see these catheters were placed um, into the lumpectomy cavity. And then we use a high dose rate, so high dose rate source, an iridium um, source, that then goes into the catheters and at various time points will sit along different what we call dwell positions to deliver the radiation more or less from the inside out. And here's a um, a plan where you can see the dose uh, distribution. So people who do this are big fans of it, find it very effective. Um, however, you could see that it's a little bit tedious. And so early on, uh, medical device companies kind of came up with um, a little bit more user-friendly options. So this was one of the first balloon catheters where you only have one catheter and you can see it fits into the um, uh, breast cavity like that. But there have been several other catheters that have been designed and explored. This one is a strut-based catheter. So you can see you can kind of shape it a little bit more. Uh, these pictures don't represent all cavities very well because they're not all circular, but you can kind of see that there's different shapes and sizes. So it allows you to individualize the treatment. It's, uh, it also uses um, an iridium source. Um, here at Stanford, we more um, commonly use just external beam radiation, which is basically using our linear accelerators. And instead of designing the treatment for the whole breast, we design it to treat just the lumpectomy cavity. So here you can see a, an example of the dose distribution for radiation to the whole breast, where you can see the green is the 95% of the dose versus the partial breast, where you have a much more focal um, uh, and localized treatment. So um, this is an option for women with small tumors that don't involve lymph nodes, and we will discuss that sometimes with them. The other thing that we've been looking at here at Stanford over the last several years is using what's called intraoperative radiation. So this is utilizing a, a special um, radiation machine that's in the operating room. And at the time of surgery, after the surgeon takes out the tumor, uh, uh, we put a lead plate underneath the breast tissue and the radiation is delivered to the surrounding tissue or the margins of the cavity. Um, this is actually a device in Italy, but we had here um, at Stanford, this is an older version, an ortho voltage version, but now we have what's called the Mobitron. Actually, this, oh, I didn't bring in the better picture, but in any case, this is electron radiation whereby we move the patient underneath this um, collimator and we deliver the radiation uh, just to the surgical area. What's nice about this is it's one treatment. Um, the patient is done with the surgery and the radiation in one setting, so it's very convenient for the patient and fairly minimal toxicity. But certainly it's only appropriate um, for certain cases, and that, as I mentioned, is when um, uh, 
sorry, I'm on call and I just got a, <laughs> um, I think this is okay. Um, only for patients with small tumors uh, that don't involve the lymph nodes. Otherwise, the whole breast radiotherapy and the nodal radiation is more appropriate. Um, okay. Um, okay. So how do we do radiation? Um, Archie's going to talk about treatment planning, but basically how we approach things is we first have uh, a new patient consultation. So this is when we will meet the patient, although now we're meeting them all virtually, um, but we review their pathology, review the imaging. We do a lot with imaging. So CT, ultrasound, as I mentioned, MRI in breast mammography. Um, and then we'll talk to the patient about our recommendation of whether we recommend radiation or not, what that radiation entails, how many treatments, what the side effects are, and then we'll get consent. Then the patient comes back for stimulation, which is typically a CT scan in the treatment position, uh, which I'll go through in just a second. Um, and then the patient will go home. In the meantime, we do what we call contouring, which is outlining the area that we want to target, as well as outlining the organs at risk, so the normal organs that we want to avoid. We work with our physicists and our decimetrists, one of whom you'll meet um, with Archie in the next session, to design a treatment plan that's specific to the patient's anatomy and the patient's um, clinical situation. We then have our physicists do uh, quality assurance. They check the plan. They also uh, obviously check the machines on a regular basis. And then the patient comes back to start treatment. So a big part of the treatment is making sure that they're in the correct position. So additional time is spent setting them up, taking some films, either KV images or now um, very routinely cone beam CT scans um, to confirm alignment before the radiation is actually delivered. Then after the patient completes their course of treatment, which can be anywhere from uh, gosh, one day to six or seven weeks, we often see patients in follow-up and follow them in their imaging um, with scans. During the treatment, actually, we also see them uh, weekly, uh, what we call on-treatment visits. Uh, sometimes if they're having more symptoms or side effects, we'll see them more frequently. And um, I was just going to say, the residents are very much involved in all of this, and sometimes they get called uh, more than once a week for certain patients. Uh, so we get really involved with patients and have a lot of continuity of care with all of our patients. So I mentioned the simulation. This is an example of a breast cancer patient um, being simulated. We put them in the more routinely in the supine position, sometimes prone, uh, with their arm up over their head so we don't treat their arm. And then we get the CT scan. All of our treatment planning right now is based on CT scans, although in the future it might be um, MR-based. I sometimes treat patients in the prone position. So this is similar to the MRI, but we have a special table that uh, obviously the contralateral breast is pushed away, so only the ipsilateral breast is exposed. And the advantage of this is it pulls the breast tissue away from the lung that we would obviously want to avoid. The other way we've been able to minimize normal tissue toxicity, especially on the left uh, with respect to the heart, is using what we call deep inspiration breath hold. So we have the capability of doing four-dimensional CT scans, which means in addition to getting 3D anatomy, we also get information according to their respiratory cycle. So this is an example, and this is one slice during an expiratory phase, where you can see if I'm trying to treat the left breast, the, the heart it, is very, very close to the chest wall. So that makes it very challenging to minimize scatter radiation to the heart. During inspiration, you get a little bit more separation, um, but you can still see the LAD is very close uh, to the chest uh, and the breast. But by using deep inspiration breath hold, which means the patient takes a breath in and holds it for a few seconds, you can get even more separation as well as um, the heart muscle and the LAD getting pulled inferiorly so even further distance away from the breast. So for patients undergoing radiotherapy to the left side, we pretty routinely use deep inspiration breath hold to minimize any cardiac toxicity. 
you're going to go through this a lot more detail with Archie, but I just wanted to show an example of uh, contouring and planning where we will identify the lumpectomy cavity and the breast tissue that we want to treat. And as I mentioned, the heart um, and the lung that we want to avoid. And so that allows us to design the treatment plan with our team um, to individualize treatment. And interestingly, everyone's anatomy is so different in that even though the heart sits a little bit more to the left side in most patients, sometimes it's more anterior, sometimes it's more posterior, sometimes it's more, more to the right. And I had a patient recently with pectus. Um, so you really have to individualize the treatment plan for the patient's anatomy in addition to their tumor. This is just a picture of a uh, modern linear accelerator, which I think you saw some pictures of yesterday. Um, so I won't go into that. And then here is an example of the radiation delivery. So you have the patient on the table. And for breast cancer, we use what we call medial and lateral tangents, which skim the breast so it doesn't go through the patient's chest, but rather comes at an um, oblique angle to target the breast tissue. Um, it sounds like Archie will go through a little bit more detail, but in the head of the machine, you can see what we call multi-leaf collimators, which help shape the beam so we can kind of make it more homogeneous so there's not hot spots or cold spots and also block out um, areas that we want to avoid. I wanted to bring in um, a, a slide about protons versus photons. We use photons and most radiation facilities use photons. I think you had a physics lecture yesterday so you might have heard a little bit more about this but I commonly get asked about protons. Um, Proton, the advantage of protons is that it has this sharp fall off. So here's the, and the red is the proton. You can prescribe protons to a certain depth at which you're going to get full dose, after which it quickly drops off and you get almost no dose. Versus photons, where you get a little bit of a buildup, and while uh, you may get full dose at, at a certain depth, you get this slow um, drop off. So you still get dose even further out past the target that you want to focus on. So there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not protons are more advantageous with less toxicity. And there's several different studies that have explored it in different disease sites. Um, I think what I tell patients is that I think our community, radiation oncology community, agrees that in pediatric patients that it's probably um, a good option, particularly in the brain, to minimize normal brain exposure. But in breast cancer and other common cancers, it's being debated. Now, the advantage in breast cancer, particularly on the left side, as you can see, this is a nice plan that sh kind of shapes around the heart. So you get very little dose to the heart. But the disadvantage of protons is it's very expensive. So institutions that offer it, it uh, costs a lot. So right now, at least with breast cancer, there's a randomized trial that's looking at women undergoing treatment to the left side, and they're randomizing women to photons or protons. So obviously, this is in facilities that have both modalities. And it's going to be looking specifically at cardiac toxicity and whether or not um, protons do indeed reduce the chance of um, cardiac toxicity. So I think it's an important study that is ongoing, but until we get the results, we don't know for sure that it's going to make a clinically significant difference, but certainly an important area of investigation. So um, just to kind of conclude, um, we use radiotherapy. It kind of went through a lot, but we use it for DCIS after lumpectomy. We also use it for invasive cancers, where I talked about routinely using whole breast radiotherapy, but sometimes in select cases using partial breast radiation dif using the different techniques. Um, here, as I mentioned, we use the either the external beam partial breast or the intraoperative radiation. And then, of course, um, uh, I didn't talk, after mastectomy I mentioned, we also use it in, if lymph nodes are involved, we use it to the lymph node regions. I didn't talk about um, radiotherapy for metastatic disease, but we often use radiation for bone metastases, so patients who have pain related to uh, bone metastases or an area of concern for fracture. And we're also, um, you'll hear a little bit more about this in some of the other lectures and, and certainly with the uh, patient consults next week that 
we're now using what we call stereotactic body radiotherapy for metastases to lung or liver. In breast cancer, we don't use it as much because um, sometimes it's not as isolated, but that is something that we're exploring. And as well as stereotactic radiosurgery for brain um, or CNS metastases, that is very commonly used in this setting of um, uh, breast cancer meta metastatic to the brain. So uh, radiation is used a lot uh, for women undergoing treatment for breast cancer. And um, while many people don't hear about it, it is an important modality that combined with surgery and systemic therapy improves the overall outcome of patients. So um, with that, I'd thank you for your attention. I know that was a whirlwind overview, but I'm happy to take any questions